Hello, this is Rosemary Kendiff at Utah State Archives. Welcome to our webinar. Today we're going to talk about Grandma and the Open Records Portal. We've had a lot of interest in the Open Records Portal and so we hope to be able to answer some of your questions. And I'm Dylan Mace. I'm the administrator of the Open Records Portal. And in case you are not aware, Rosemary is the Grandma Ombudsman. So um, here's the, the opening screen on the Open Records Portal. And Rosemary is going to do some of the history of the portal. And then I'll do some of the more detailed stuff later on. So we thought we'd talk about how the Open Records Portal came about. So one of the uh, objectives in Grama is to make public records reasonably available to the public. So a few years back, such as uh, 2013, the legislature was looking for ways to, to accomplish this goal and to make public information more available online. So in 2013, the legislature passed House Bill 283, and it created the Utah Transparency Advisory Board within the Department of Administrative Services, and it assigned the board to come up with a plan for making more public information accessible through an information website. So the objective of the Transparency Advisory Board was to study this proposal and come up, come back with recommendations to the legislature about how to do this, how to make more information available online as well as at the same time safe, safeguarding privacy of sensitive information. So the they were supposed to provide a report about their recommendations in November of that year. And so the, the board studied that and sent out a survey about commonly requested records. They thought maybe if we can focus in on grandma requests and see what people are asking for, that would provide guidance for the kinds of records that we need to make available online. So within this discussion, it sort of moved from talking about what people are asking for in grandma requests to the idea of putting the possibility of making grandma requests into this process. So the board made a recommendation, and this is part of the report, but they suggested an open Utah government website that would include the transparent Utah.gov, which was already online. That's where all of the state's uh, financial information is, where every governmental entity provides their financial information. They suggested data.utah.gov, which was uh, a site for data, which is governed by DTS, and then open records at utah.gov. And <clears throat> the open records would be a central location where the public can go to find public information about all governmental entities in Utah. So in 2014, Deidre Henderson sponsored the Utah Data Portal Amendments bill, which passed, and that bill required, it implemented the work of the Transparency Board and required the state archives to, to initiate a one-stop searchable, searchable data portal where people can go to access public records. So there was a, a two-fold goal in this and that was to link to records that are already available online so that the public can go to a particular governmental entity and find the records that are online about that entity, but also to be able to make grandma requests. So the initial deadline, the, well, let's see, the bill passed in 
2014 in March, and the legal mandate was to have the website up and running by January 1st, which was like nine months later. So the archives became very involved in, in uh, putting this together. So the law required that by January 1st of 2015, all state agencies would be in the portal so that the public can make requests to state agencies. And then on January 1st, 2016, cities, towns, school districts, transit districts, and counties were to be added to the portal. And then by January 1st, 2017, uh, local and special districts were added to the portal. And that is what the law mandated. So this is who's not in the portal. And they're not in the portal because the legislature didn't call them out and require them to be in the portal. But those that are not in the portal are the legislature, the courts, the universities, higher education, and all of the elected officials, such as the governor's office, the attorney general's office, the auditor, state auditor, all of those are not in the portal. So developing this portal has been challenging. First of all, it's challenging to imagine something that doesn't really exist yet and to think of all the possibilities and how you want it to work. So, and to do that in such a short time. So the archives used a computer programming system that we already had and I don't know what else to say about that, but a secondary challenge was to have all the data that's behind the, the scenes. So we, the archives already was keeping track of governmental entities and records officers. But as you know, governmental entities change constantly and so do records officers. And so one of the challenging parts of this project was to update our information. So in the last several months of 2014, we scrambled to make sure that the hierarchy and the records officers for state agencies that were reflected in our database was accurate and up to date. And the following year, we contacted all of the counties and cities and towns in the state and to make sure that their records officers are up to date. And perhaps the most challenging was the third year when we were trying to identify every local and special district in the state and figure out who their records officers were and make that information accurate. So that was one of the challenges. So this is a screenshot of an entity in the portal. And I would like to point out that this kind of captures the twofold vision of having a site where the public can access records online or make grandma requests. So if you go to any site, you will see that there is a list of the record series that that agency has scheduled. And those that have, we have links to records online appear first. So a member of the public can go to Moab, as this example is, and if they click on the link for budgets, they can see the budgets. If they don't see what they want there, then they can scroll down to the bottom and see the name and contact information for the records officer, and they can make a request. So I would say that one of the challenges in developing the portal is this idea of gathering links to records that are online. We haven't really been able to 
do that as well as we would like, and that's certainly a goal for the future. But for now, the number of grandma requests that are going through the portal is ever increasing, and I know it's a learning curve for everyone involved, and so uh, Dylan Mace is the administrator for the portal, and he's going to jump in and talk about the portal and provide some, in, some kind of how-to tips for using it. So first off, I'm just going to, who's making requests and what are they asking for? And when I began working at the, on the open records portal, I assumed that much of the traffic going through the portal would be the public or journalists kind of keeping an eye on their local governments. There is some of this, but it is actually a far smaller share of the traffic than I expected. The citizen watchdog is a pretty rare thing on the portal. Most of the journalism requests that I see are for bigger research pieces, more in-depth articles and the portal is not where journalists look for breaking or scandalous news. A large number of the requests that are made through the portal are from businesses. Some businesses are researching contracts. Often a business is preparing a contract bid with some entity or another and wants to see what earlier successful bids were. So they re request that last successful bid through the portal. Um, another, er another business area that I see use the portal extensively are construction and engineering firms. They're often preparing site assessments and request records on a property and the surrounding properties so that they're aware of toxic waste, petroleum products, faults, anything that might impact their plans for the site. So it sounds like a lot of businesses. Oh, it's, I, I would say, just off the top of my head, I'd say probably three quarters of the traffic through the portal is business. Um, there's you know, something I never would have thought of are individuals in real estate who are looking for uh, something I see fairly often. There, It sounds like it's not just one real estate firm, it's several um, looking for code violations on houses. I assume that their assumption is that somebody who's unable to maintain their house would maybe want to sell it. So they're looking for who can't maintain their houses to make offers on them. And um, I also assumed there'd be lots of um, legal like police reports and things like that. There are a fair number of them, but far fewer than I would have assumed. Um, lawyers use it in that respect a bit. And some of my favorites are people checking up on family members new uh, boyfriend or girlfriend to see if they're on the up and up or if they're maybe a bigamist because <laughs> there have been rumors that somebody was already married uh, and finally I kind of like to turn around the question and say who's not using the portal and the people who are not using it are actually vexatious requesters it seems like they like that personal interaction with the person that they're driving crazy and so the portal doesn't lend itself very well to that. And um, here's just a chart of portal usage since its uh, inception. And this year started off with a bang. And that 198 red line there, that's the average from last year. And so far this year, everything is well above last year's average. So um, sometimes I get calls from people who've never used the portal and I used to foolishly say that you might not ever use it again, but that quickly turned me into a liar. So I don't make that claim anymore. And this is just the year to year usage of the portal for people making requests. And we're just, I think nine requests away this year from uh, reaching the halfway mark of last year's numbers, so kind of cruising along with that. So as far as feedback that I've gotten from users of the portal, 
The portal elicits strong feelings. Many records officers have told me that they love it. Many have told me that they hate it. The records officers who appreciate it have told me that they like the standardization of the requests and the response options. They like that people who make the requests need to fill in areas of the request that they sometimes don't do on a written request. Some cities have systems that serve a similar function to the portal, so they're frustrated that there is an overlap. Um, other entities on the portal are so small that they have only received one or two record requests through it ever. Then there are all, all of the extremely small entities, like many of the special service districts, that never receive any requests. As far as people who make requests, it has been well received. One individual whose job necessitates that he makes records requests in multiple states said that when he requests records in other states, it sometimes takes him days or weeks to find all of the addresses that he needs to submit requests to. And in Utah, he can just do it all over, you know, maybe an afternoon. Because we did all that work. We did all the work for him. <clears throat> And like I said, with those, those two charts, the use of the portal continues to surge. So I, I don't expect that to change. We have a question. OK. Uh, the question is, why is 2018 so much higher than the others? Um, 2018 is the full year of last year. So that's full 12 months. And you know we had 1,000 more requests last year than the year before it. And this year we've only had four months and it's already over a thousand. So I wouldn't be surprised at the rate we're going for it to break 3000 by the end of the year. So I expect it'll just keep being a, it'll be a while before it plateaus. It'll just keep being a sharp slope upward. I think it's because people are discovering it. I mean, it's there, but most people don't know. And yeah. as more and more people figure out that it's there and learn how to use it, mm -hmm. they will. And I also hope to more and more be able to link records that are maybe already available so that people make requests or, well, they go in to make a request and see that the doc document's already online and so that doesn't interrupt the records officer's day-to-day -day job. Uh, people that, making the requests the just, yeah, just bypass them entirely and find the records online without having to request them. So um, just going to go through how a request made and how they're responded to. So I made a few requests last week to the records officer for the state archive. So that's Kendra. And just have some examples of, of those requests and how they were made and how she responded to them. And I know that one of the, one of the complaints about the public notice website is it's so difficult to find the entity you're looking for. Uh, the open records portal has a much better way of finding things. You don't have to know all of the breakdown of all of the state entities in, in Utah. So it's pretty simple to just type in a keyword and, and find who you're looking for. So since I was making a request essentially to my own entity, <laughs> typed in the archive and here's a, a basic open request. request Ah, can't speak all of a sudden. Basic open records portal request there. So, you know, it's your standard online file and you put in the dates that you want, where you are and everything, and then you hit submit. And, ta-da, it shows up there. And then this is the request as Kendra received it and how records officers view the requests. Up in the right-hand corner, you can print the request. Often a document is too big to share online or it's a, you know, a CD that you're going to send to someone in the mail. So if you're going to do that, I think the best way to do it is print the request and then hit respond outside the portal so you don't forget to because 
if you open it up and then don't go back in here, it will mark as um, timed out and declined because of that. So that's one thing that I hear from a lot. Somebody gets a notice that the request that they responded to timed out and was declined, but they really did respond to it. So if you just push that respond outside portal button on the top right hand corner, you won't have to worry about that. So here's just a few more views of that request. And there are the delivery methods. And like I said, often people will just do it outside the portal. If that's easier for you, go right ahead. But there are a lot of options within the portal to do that as well. And here she uploaded a file, chose the file. response was closed. And here we have an example of a, a denial. And once again, I just made the request to Kendra. And um, she put in the deny request reason and the, rec the records don't exist. So uh, that actually happens fairly often. A lot of people are looking for things that don't exist, so you don't have to supply those. Well, you can't, even if you <laughs> well, want to. Well, right, but, but, but part of, in grandma, it says that grandma, by law, you don't have to create records that don't exist if somebody requests them. And so there, there it's closed, and Referrals are one that I think causes a lot of confusion. And um, here's one that, once again, Kendra replied to. She goes in, chooses the, the name of the person and the agency. And she's referring it because it doesn't exist. So it's because another entity has that record? Mm -hmm. So one thing that, unfortunately, the portal does not redirect the request if you refer it. It'll tell the person making the record request who to contact, but it doesn't actually contact that person for them. And I think sometimes that the public doesn't understand that. So they think it's being taken care of, but they don't realize that they have more work to do before any more work can be done. We have a question. Okay. Can a city <clears throat> just charge like a flat rate for a grammar request? Like if you submit a, a request to us, then you have to, it's $5 or $10 or something, just no matter what. They would have to put it in an ordinance or policy that they could do that. I think they could do that. Cool. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> and then often someone will re request some record that compiling all of the records related to their request is going to take more than 10 days. And the portal, it's been designed with that in mind. And so you can come in, here, here Kendra has replied again, and she can go in and say when it will be done. This is kind of a wiggle out of the 10 day rule. And so it comes in here and chooses when it will be available. And that will notify the person making the request that it's going to take some extra time, and this is when we estimate it will be due. I mean, when it will be complete. So this screen, a bit of confusion that arises often is after a record is closed, after it's been responded to, it no longer shows up on this screen. And in that case, 
in blue on the kind of middle right hand side, it says advanced search. And with that, you can go in and choose whether you see just the close, I mean, just the open requests, or if you see all requests that have been made. So that will show you every request that you have made or responded to, depending on whether you're the public or records officer. So that is, that's that. Let's ask Rosemary about fee waivers. No, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, often, especially um, with journalism, because it's a, the way the law is written, if it's for the public good, you can request a fee waiver because um, you're not making money off of it. You're doing a service for the community. So you can come into the, when you're making a request, you can request that you not pay whatever um, fees might be associated with it. And so that can be waived in here. And there it is. So did Kendra accept your request? She for a accepted fee? the fee waiver. And said, yes, I will waive the fees. Yep. But you could say no. You can say no, and people often say no, and people often come to the archive, I mean to the state records committee, and that's what they're arguing is that they should have a fee waiver. I'm sure Rosemary has stories that she could share about that. I have another question. Okay. So how much flexibility do we have in creating our own grandma forms? Do we just have to have an ordinance or policy for it? There's a grandma form that, so outside of the portal, you can download just a PDF of a, a standard grandma form. Also, there is a way within the portal that you can change the form, so you can ask people to supply some more information. Um, I've not drilled down enough in this presentation to show that, but if you want to contact me, I could uh, get you more information about that, <clears throat> but. Um, but what about like outside of the portal? So if, well, the law just requires that a request be in writing. So it has to be in writing, and then it has to contain certain information, like a description of the records and contact information. So if a city wants to have a specific form or wants to direct more specifically how a grandma request can be made, then they have to create an ordinance or policy about that. Otherwise, an email is good enough. There doesn't really need to be a form. So, I mean, some cities have done that. Some have not done that. But I'd like to say a little more about my response on the ordinance about fees. So, like, if you have police reports or something that you routinely do, you can set the fee at $5 per request or whatever it is. But if you are processing a request that requires you to research or summarize or gather information, it's kind of a one-of-a-kind request, then you can charge for the staff time for doing that. But according to the law, you can't charge for the first 15 minutes. So I think a lot of things that are easily accessible um, wouldn't take that long to respond to, and therefore it might be problematic to have an ordinance that just says we have a fee for processing every grandma request. So if there is someone out there who would like to talk about that a little more, or that is helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. So the portal of the future. Um, the portal has kind of been a, you know, it wasn't complete until 
last January. And so kind of at this point, I think there's an opportunity to look at how it would like to be developed and improved. Yeah, we really want to redesign it, don't we? We do. Unfortunately, um, as many issues as people might have with the portal, there are no better examples to look to. Utah is really ahead of the game in this kind of thing. Um, I know that a few other states are looking into this kind of thing, but as yet, it's it's fairly unique. And um, so, I personally would like a lot more records to just be linked directly to the portal. Part of that is that we need a better system to do that, but part of it is the entities within the portal need to create links. Moab that um, Rosemary was showing the link to earlier, they actually have a really fantastic system. Rachel, who's the records officer there, has put a ton of work and effort into that. So I've been really impressed with what she's done and it's really useful. I think it seems to me it's, it's a lot of front end work, but long term that takes a lot of load off of records officers when they have records requests being made to them, they can just direct the public to the to that, and eventually the public just knows that that is where they can find the documents they're looking for. I personally would really like for the portal to be more integrated with the public notice website. So rather than having two systems, I'd like there to be overlap where you can see both of those because, you know, everything on the public notice website is a document that is publicly available, so why not just have it visible there? What would you like to do, Rosemary? Well, for sure, see more records online, but I think, you know, getting records online and also keeping all the information current, like who's the records officer, what's their contact information, all of that, we need it to be a conversation. We need the capability for records officers to be able to go in and update that information, put their own records online. I mean, when it becomes interactive for records officers to use this tool to push information out there instead of just for the archives to try to find it and populate things, then it will be a, it will fulfill the legislature's dream of being this central place where the public can access records and information about government in Utah. So, I mean, hopefully we'll be able to, to create that possibility in the near future. Mm -hmm. I would also like to hear what people are thinking out there who are either responding to requests through the portal or making them. We need more feedback. So. And I've reached out to a lot of the records officers who see the most requests being made through the portal, and I've gotten a lot of really good input on how they would like it to be changed and updated. So if you have ideas, we are very welcoming of those, because as we go through and do these updates, um, the updates are only as good as the ideas behind them. So if you have a fantastic idea, that'll help the portal be much better. So, right, we can't process the fees through the portal. Maybe someday we can do that. Uh, all those entities that are not on the portal, maybe they'll want to be someday too. So, yeah. are there questions or, or suggestions? We should have that theme music we were talking about.
look like there are any questions so far. Well, if you have any more questions or comments or anything really, there's um, all of the contact information is on the Open Records portal or the archive website. So feel free to contact me or Rosemary or you know, if you have other questions that are more like records management or anything, we can certainly find that as well on the, on the website. Very good. I would like to see a vote out there of who like who who likes the portal and who doesn't. Yay or nay? Thumbs up or thumbs down? You know? <laughs> There's no way to do that. There's no way to do that. <laughs> but it's definitely a pioneering, innovative thing as far as uh, access to government records. I guess that's all for now. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for the RIM webinars this year. And we look forward to seeing you throughout the year and at our RIM webinars next year. <laughs>